I know all of you have been sitting around wondering what could happen if you don't punctuate things properly. So we're going to look at that. Um, <coughs> see here what this means. It's not exactly politically correct thing to say, but you know, a woman without her man, it's not it. Or we could punctuate it this way. Opposite meaning, right? I've seen people punctuate things where they have crazy results. So you don't want that to happen. Um, this actually, in terms of grammar, can mean that he thinks that um, women are dogs and pigs. But he loves, he still loves them. I mean, pigs and dogs are lovable, but I think this is what he really means, is that there are three things that he loves. And that's where that serial comma really helps you. Another example, um, this is the letter that John got, and this is how he read it. I want a man who knows what love is all about. You're a generous, kind, thoughtful. People who are not like you admit, admit to being useless and inferior. You have ruined me for other men. I yearn for you. I have no feelings whatsoever when we're apart. I can be forever happy. Will you let me be yours? Okay. Unfortunately, Jane um, really didn't know how to use punctuation, and this is what she meant to send. I want a man who knows what love is. All about you are generous, kind, thoughtful people who are not like you. Admit to being useless and inferior. You have ruined me. For other men, I yearn. For you, I have no feelings whatsoever. When we're apart, I can be forever happy. Will you let me be? Yours, Jane. Okay. Same words, same order. So now let's get started. All right? So the P1A rule is quite simple. It basically says you use a column before a coordinating conjunction joining two independent clauses. And if that sounded like another language, we're going to break it down. Okay, coordinating conjunction is one of these words. And how many of you have seen the fanboys before? Okay, great. Just another way of remembering what they are. Independent clauses can be thought of as something that could be a separate sentence grammatically. They have a subject and they have an object and they can stand alone, but you've chosen to combine them with something else in the sentence. Okay, what the comma does is it just tells the reader that one idea has come to an end and another's about to begin. All right. Where do we put the comma? Before and. Before and. Yeah. Nice and simple, right? Okay. And what about this one? before the but. I know this is a minor thing, but I like to think of it as being after chocolate. And that's because it's, it's finishing up this thing, and that's where it's going. Okay. Here's some examples of some quotes of people who have been familiar with the P1A rule and have used it. And so you can see that the thing that comes after the, the conjunction, the and and the but, is a complete idea. The pessimist knows it. You are doomed if you don't try. This might seem really obvious right at this moment, okay? But um, let's go ahead and look, do some practice. If you look at your page three on that sheet, here's a few examples. You can run through those and Go not, and then we'll do them. We'll do them up here. Okay, look, let's look at number one. So, uh, does it need a comma? I said yeah. <coughs> That's a good guess. I put yeah. Well, what what made you wonder what? If you look at the next one, number two, that one doesn't need a comma. And what's the difference between those two sentences? So we got a we. Exactly. And so um, without that we in there, you don't have an independent clause anymore. 
because it's depending on the first week, and so it's a dependent clause. And so one thing you can look for, say when you have a sentence like this, and the we is not there in the second half, which is grammatical, but you say, this sentence is so long, I don't like going and saying that whole sentence without being able to pause with a comma. I just like the sound of that, and I just so this sentence is cumbersome. But you don't want to just add a comma, so to make it grammatical and punctuated correctly, you can go ahead and add that second subject, go ahead and add the we, and that's an option for you as well. Okay. How about this one? Yes. A brave soul thinks yes. And you can see that these are all independent clauses that could stand alone as sentences. What about this one? No. No, thank you. So obviously the may go home to see your high school friends is not an independent clause. So you could add the she in there, and if you added the she, you could have a home. Okay, how about this one? The question here, of course, is is the phrase carefully place that evidence in a plastic bag an independent clause or not? Yes, because it's in the imperative case. I'm giving an order. Carefully place that. And so that is a complete sentence. And um, if you're not sure about an imperative, you can see that in Hacker. Um, but basically, the imperative has an implied you in the sentence. You, go ahead and place that in the plastic bag. So that is a, um, another independent. OK, let's go on. From to the P1B rule. So the question here is just, what is an introductory word group? That's the trick, of course, is identifying what those word groups are. So we're going to be looking at words, uh, clauses, and phrases. Basically, what these words do is tell you an answer to these questions. How, when, why, and so on is the main part of the sentence. Under one, what conditions does this occur? The reason for the rule is that the introductory part, part is ended and we now want to shift our attention to the main part and the comma helps avoid some confusion. So could you go ahead and read that for me? When Erwin was ready to eat his cat, jumped onto the table and started to burn. Okay, that was pretty good. So there was just a little hint of some confusion there, right? So is Erwin going to eat his cat or is the cat going to jump onto the table? Right, And the comma would help us out there. Right? And define what is actually happening. How about this one? Near a creek at the bottom of the canyon, we discovered a huge horn gorilla. Okay, you kind of had a couple of pauses in there, which naturally follows the meaning. So you were adding some meaning to it. And we can see there um, that we have that comma because the main part of the sentence is we discovered a huge flying gorilla. And the rest of it is just explaining where it happened. Now. There is a question about whether you want to have another comma here or not to show that these are two different ideas and you could do that. Um, it's not completely the same. Okay. Start with introductory words. These are, these are words like however, still, furthermore, and meanwhile. And they're basically being used as transition words. And we're going to talk a lot more about transition words and how you can use them. But for now, we're just going to look at it in terms of the fact that you need a comma after them. Okay? How else could you punctuate this sentence? These sentences, excuse me. This is a this is correct. So what what would be another option for you? What if you use the same words in the same order? Sunny cold. You could substitute that period with a semicolon and it would show the two connected. We'll talk more about semicolons later. Same thing here. You've got that comma after still. But this, if you're familiar with this pattern, because you can also substitute a semicolon here and have that comma, um, a lot of times you see people putting a semicolon here and a comma <coughs> here, and that's throwing off the meaning. The meanwhile is going with the next part of the sentence. 
This is a minor exception. There are times when you don't need a comma after that first introductory word or word groups. And that is when the meaning is really clear and it's very short. And the way I test something like this is just by reading it out loud and saying, what kind of feeling do I want to have it have when I'm reading it? You know, at first, I thought, the and in, in which case you put the comma there. But if you want it to roll, and you're not emphasizing the first part, at first I thought, and, you, and you're not pausing, that is a case where you consider that an optional comma. Okay, next thing, introductory clauses. These are dependent clauses that set the stage, and um, they follow these kinds of words. After, although, as, because, before, if, since, though, until. What's interesting about these is that if you take out that first word, that first adverb, you generally have an independent clause, because you've got your subject and your, um, your verb. But because you've added that extra word, you've made it a dependent clause. Lots of times you make your sentences ungrammatical by simply adding in these words when they aren't needed. So if I, if I slash it out, you'll know that's what's going on. In any case, here we have an introductory clause that begins with, with if. And the main clause is athletes must, must exercise every day. And the if they want to win is the part right, that's dependent. And because he kept barking insistently, we threw the ball for some Lastly, we've got introductory phrases. And these are where they're still setting the main action, but they are not complete clauses because they, they don't have both a subject and a verb. Okay? And I listed these names for these phrases. We're not actually going to be um, going over what, what these each one is. What I want you to be able to identify is that you've got something that doesn't have a subject and a verb that's introduced in the main part. And from my point of view, it doesn't matter if you can label it or not. But some of you have already learned this language in high school, so you can go ahead and apply it. So in this case, for example, a popular, well-respected mayor is describing Bailey. And when it describes somebody, it's in a positive. And that's what we've got. Um, the other thing, uh, a participial phrase, you can tell this because it's got that ing on it. It's modifying the top of it. Any questions? Okay, here are just a few examples of some of the quotes where people are using it. Okay.